If we compare what happened with the uh, attempt of, of Trump to what happened with Kennedy back in uh, 66, if I'm not mistaken, what did you have back then? Completely shocking event. So you've shocked the nation and then you've given them the story and then we found the guy. So it's all good. Who still believes that? Who still believes 100% the official narrative of the Kennedy assassination? That all needs obliterating. I think it's uber important though. Bing bong, I am back with another edition of the State of Bitcoin podcast where I've got the man, the myth, the legend, Daniel Prince in the house. But before we dive into everything that's related to Bitcoin, we did just have a big thing happen over this past weekend in the United States where President, former President Trump was uh, attempted to be assassinated at one of his uh, rallies here in Pennsylvania. But I think the bigger story behind all of this is what was announced right before that was that Trump is going to talk at the Bitcoin conference here in Nashville in about a week and a half or maybe even two weeks. Um, so with all this going on, there's rumors floating that he might back or put Bitcoin on the U.S. balance sheet to help pay off the national debt. I know that you've got a ba uh, background in banking. Now, do you think that that would help us? get out of this national debt situation, or do you just think that this, this will kind of, kind of just add to the facade of the fiat world that we're in right now? If you were to to start stacking Bitcoin onto the um, onto the US balance sheet, you mean? If, if that was, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> would that get you out of the debt? Man, I don't know. Have you seen the size of that thing? Like, really? <laughs> There's a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> I know. I feel like there's just like no way out at this point. And, uh, you know, it, but it is interesting because if you kind of look back at the previous presidents that tried to go against the Fed, all of them either gotten uh, assassinated, attempted to be assassinated or, uh, you know, kind, kind of in, in that realm. So it seems like it is kind of fishy timing to me that, uh, you know, President Trump is you know, uh, this kind of happened at this time. Maybe it's maybe it's tinfoil hat and it's more of a conspiracy theory. But, um, you know, at the same time, you know, what are we going to do to kind of get out of that system? You know, I know you have a background in banking and, you know, obviously borrowing more money to, to basically like future energy to kind of help what's going on now. We're just getting into this snowball and snowball and snowball where essentially there's no way out and the system is going to fail. We all know that as Bitcoiners. But is this kind of is Bitcoin almost a life raft needed to help us, I guess, you know, keep the, the dollar around for a little bit longer before we get into a full Bitcoin standard? Or how do you think we get there? Yeah, very good. Uh, very good points. I mean, yeah, God, who knows how it's going to come up? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if they were to to stack Bitcoin straight onto the uh, the, the balance sheet, and uh, well, yeah, what are you going to do? End the Fed, and then I, I still don't know how it works. What you just stack it into the U.S. Treasury, and that then you become the backstop of the financial system. You move everybody across to a parallel parallel system. Uh, I know that God, it's just such a mess. So much to unweave. And um, so many bad actors as well at play. Uh, so as you as you just mentioned, um, you know, there was an attempt on his life just yesterday at, at the time of recording. And we know, yes, people are going to say, tip, put your tinfoil hats on and whatever else. But just look at the facts. OK, here's the thing. When you when you talk about conspiracy theories that I've come to kind of craft my mind uh, and and craft my thinking and think from principles thinking, you know, like uh, someone like Jeff. Booth would, would say. I put up from there. The question you have to ask yourself is do you believe, do you 100% believe the official narrative? 100%. On anything, yeah. not just yesterday, on anything. On 9 11, on the sinking of the Titanic, on the moon landing, you know, all the favorite conspiracy theories. Put all of that aside for one second, that conspiracy theory idea. Go back to the official narrative that you've been taught or that you've watched play out, depending on whether you were alive at the time of the event or not. Then go to that official narrative, read it again, go through it again, and ask yourself, do I 
100% believe this official narrative. 100%. It can't be 99%. It's got to be 100%. Because if not, it turns out you're a conspiracy theorist. Complete and utter, complete nonsense. But that is the world in which we live in right now. And now, do you 100% believe the narrative of the uh, attempted assassination yesterday? Do you believe uh, that dude that was in full plain sight of everybody on a roof, not just not just everybody, I mean everybody, including the Secret Service, everybody in the crowd who were even pointing at him and yelling at police officers to say, what's going on up there? There's a dude up there. I just see crawl up there. Like, you know, but we're being told, yeah, he was the guy that, you know, just escaped through the net and everything, and he made the shot. Do you believe that 100%? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to believe that, you know, a 20 year old kid, right, would be able to outsmart people that have gone their entire lives being trained for a moment like this. Right. I mean, it is it is kind of an interesting little little mind game here that we have to play. But yeah, like you said, if you doubt any any single bit of it, any single ounce, you're labeled as a conspiracy theorist. And that's, you know, a huge negative. Um, so, you know, do you, I guess that that almost is a is a deeper rooted question where it's like you know you can't even think critically anymore and kind of kind of question you know what what's going on in this entire world so um yeah do, where do you think that that kind of starts why do you think that that's the case and where we've gotten to today where you know critical thinking is almost uh almost as scarce as uh, as time in bitcoin at this point <laughs> man it's gone oh well you've just led me straight into you've set me up perfectly to talk about the education system now where, uh, you know, all critical thought is absolutely obliterated uh, and by design. And um, I, I've talked about this on many other podcasts before, but if nobody... So please go out and get your hands on this book before it is completely taken out of print and you will not be able to find it anywhere because this is John Taylor Gatto's book. It's the, uh, the, under, uh, the Underground History of American Education System. This is how it was, and this is how we get to where we get to today. Because he was a teacher for thirty years, he won Teacher of the War, Teacher of the Year twice throughout his career in the nineties uh, when he was teaching in uh, in New York, and he te he taught in um, in the Bronx in like the seventies and the eighties. Like he was teaching really hard level state education schooling, and he woke up one day to realize what he had been um subjugated into like uh he, he was part of the problem he was part of this machine and he talks about this in his six lessons of schooling where he explains how the system was set up from a very early age um in the us so i'm talking about primarily in the us uh but obviously you know that gets it, it, these ideas get exported around the world and um even countries that had education systems in place before the US, such as Germany, France, and the UK, are now being led by, you know, the, the American style education. Uh, and for good reason, because it is, you are taught how to think the way they want you to think. And you are slammed in a classroom, uh, <laughs> generally, dimly or brightly lit with leds and bad light for you and uh even sometimes you know, like you know perhaps even like just one or two windows in the in the classroom with 29 strangers and you got to sit there for an hour an hour and 15 minutes whatever the length of the the lesson is and just be spoon fed have have knowledge fall down your neck as if you were a goose in a foie gras from and um that's K-1-12, and then it doesn't get any brighter or better at university level. Um, that's why we can't critically anymore. And that's why when people see the narratives being shown on the mainstream media, on their favorite you know, news channels, or whether you watch CNN or whether you watch Fox, or, you, know, you will just fall into that lockstep, and you will believe that narrative. And your opinion has been formed for the day by your favorite newspaper, even like if you're browsing the internet, you look at BBC or you look at Washington Post, your opinions formed that morning. And um, it's very, very powerful. And people, they don't have the time then because they're 
trapped on the fiat monetary system hamster wheel and they've got to get to the nine to five they've got to do the side hustle they've got to do all of the administration as well that was overbearing from the state and uh you don't have time to think you in fact you don't even want to think you just want to collapse at the end of the day into your dip in the sofa and throw netflix on which is more propaganda that's why mate uh, it's easier to call somebody a conspiracy theorist if they offer you a differing opinion because I don't have time to think about that. Just shut up. You're talking nonsense. It's much easier for me if that's just the truth and then I can get on with my life and adapt my life to, to whatever. And uh, this news is going to affect my work day in X, Y, or Z fashion. I've just got to figure out how to uh, maneuver that. How can I make me, especially if you're in markets, right? You're going to wake up this morning. It's going to go sideways, up, down, all over the place for the next 24 to 48 hours and more and more news comes out about this particular event. And then you're just consumed by that and you don't have time to sit back and actually question the narrative. Uh, so yeah, it all stems back to the foundational base of the educational system and the way in which we get shaped and formed. And uh, I, I always bastardize this, this saying, but give me a body until the age of seven and I will show you the man. And that's what is going on in the education system. Unfortunately, they take them from earlier than five. So it's, uh, yeah, way earlier than five. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're mentioning the traditional media system as well as, you know, the traditional education system. So uh, the legacy media, right? I mean, it, it, yesterday was a prime example. If you looked at all the headlines, right, it's like, you know, Trump fell, uh, you know, and they wouldn't they would refuse to call it an attempted assassination attempt. They uh, refused to say he was shot or anything like that in any headlines when they initially came out. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, we're all on Twitter and X now and, and everything like that. And so we can see the videos like the spread of information is so quick that, you know, at this point, you have a little bit more free reign to say, OK, like maybe we don't believe that because we've seen the videos or seen the clips. You know, how, how is that all, all going on now? Do you think the spread of information that we have, whether it's, you know, YouTube University, uh, uh, which is, you know, obviously kind of common where people just learn skills and everything like that on YouTube videos or, you know, whether it's social media or everything like that. Do you think that's a positive where, you know, you can spread that information quicker or do you think that's that's maybe a, a negative too because of you know the potential you know uh, almost like grooming that an algorithm can do where we can show you what we want to show you and you know we saw everything that came out with the Twitter files or everything like that like do you think that 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 almost plays a role into um, in a sense you know the lack of critical thinking? I think it's very important to have it because at least you get to see you know both sides of the coin. Uh, and you can, yes, algos can drive you in certain ways, but if you, and, and most people should be aware of that right now. So you can curate what you're looking at and you should go and see both sides of it. And then, you know, put yourself in the middle of that and figure out and try and figure out for yourself. I mean, if we, if we compare what happened yesterday with the, uh, assassination att attempt of, of Trump to what happened with Kennedy back in uh, 66, if I'm not mistaken? Um, what did you have back then? Well, we, we didn't have this alternative spread of information. We had the one or two channels, and that was it. The newspapers the next day, and that was it. A radio station, and that was it. Right? They were all in lockstep. And everybody was... I mean, it's a completely shocking event. So you've shocked the nation, and then you've given them the story, and then we found the guy. So it's all good. Who still believes that? Who still believes 100% the official narrative of the Kennedy assassination? I, can't, I bet you very few people, if any, still believe that. Now, if we'd have had in that day all of this like like we have today, my goodness, the could you imagine what would have unraveled over the next 
24 to 40 hours of the differing opinions and the differing um, anecdotal stories of people actually on the ground of what they saw and what they heard and what they filmed. People didn't have cameras in their hands back in those days, obviously. Uh, I think it's uber important that we have what we have today and that people uh, do use it and get to use it and get to post on it. Uh, it's interesting. I wonder how different X would have looked today if it was still Twitter under the previous ownership. And I'm not a Musk fanboy by any situation, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, excuse me. But it would have been different, right? Would there have been more censoring? Would all of those videos have been censored? Would everything have been taken down? Would any opposing opinion be taken down? Which is what was happening during COVID. Uh, so there's another thought experiment right there. But to, to answer your question, yeah, I think um, it, it helps vastly uh, get more stories out. And will it will knee-jerk reaction if you're looking at it, you're, you will have to start thinking differently about what you're being fed on the mainstream media or what you're being fed by your normie friends and, uh, you know, the, just the prevailing narrative of, of the day. Or even, you know, for, like you, you mentioned earlier, the traditional education system, right? I mean, you know, it, it's interesting here because I, I don't know how closely you follow sports or anything like that, but there's this big story going on that this NBA player who just recently got drafted, he got drafted by the Utah Jazz, but this huge story came out. He has like, uh, he's like an 18, 19 year old kid. He's getting groomed by his Mormon girlfriend, who's like 26, 27, a lot older than him, kind of like shaping his the way he's thinking. And they're all all NBA teams were worried about it, except for Utah, because there's, you know, a lot of a lot of Mormons in Utah just kind of coincidentally. So I don't know, maybe it didn't scare them. And, and that's way, shape or form. But it seems like. That would that was a huge story here in the US as far as like sports are concerned. But you know, that happens every single day where, you know, like you're saying in the traditional education system, everybody's being kind of, you know, formed into a certain way to think. Now I, I have an engineering background and I always tell people that they always ask me, you know, what did you really learn in your degree? And I and I always say to, to how to think, right? Like kind of like go through the steps, think critically about it. But, you know, a lot of my peers don't necessarily still go through that. So I wonder why, you know, that that has been kind of the norm for the education system. Do you think it's all a part of this master plan to kind of pull strings like puppets where, you know, if we're able to, you know, I, I guess make critical thinking more rare uh, or less of a skill that in a sense, we'd be able to, to groom people in, into thinking a certain direction? Or, uh, you know, why do you think that the education, or was it a money thing? Like, why do you think like it, it got down this rabbit hole? Are you looking for the best way to store your seed phrase? Well, I've got it for you. It's Stamp Seed. They've got the number one punch plates where you can order a full on packet where they've got every single thing. They've got all the letters. You could just get it in there. And they've got this sick, sick hammer, which they've engineered to make it so easy for you to punch in that titanium steel plate and store your seed phrase in the most secure way possible. So go ahead and get your Bitcoin off of these exchanges and use promo code green candle for 15% off. They're helping power the show. They've got the... Uh, Bitcoin logo, you can punch it into your seed phrase as well. If you could see it here, they've got a lot of cool stuff. And now I'm helping empower you to get your Bitcoin off an exchange, utilizing stamp seed and storing your seed phrase in the most secure way possible. Now get to it. All right, back to the show. Well, we have to go back to 1902. Well, to be, before that, it was in the late 1800s, there was a guy by the name of, uh, and again, you know, reference all, all reference to, to, to John Taylor Ghetto here. Uh, where I learned all of this from. Back in the 1800s, there was a guy called Horace Mann who had, uh, you know, big political ambitions. And he saw his avenue, his his best shot at, you know, getting up the political ladder, so to speak, was to, to bring forward the idea of um, uh, reforming education in, in the US. Uh, because what did you have at that point in the US? Well, you had disparate people all over the place 
many different religions, many different beliefs, people from all over Europe, from all over the world that were congregating in this new country that is being formed right underneath them. This is a sociopath or a psychi psychopath's like perfect breeding ground. How do we capture and, you know, nurture and form these people? And uh, the monopolists at the time, uh, you know, this to them was like biggest dangled carrot. And so in 1902, there was the formation of the uh, General Education Board, uh, which um, was a private organization, which was used primarily to support higher education and medical schools in the United States. It was formed in 1902 after John D. Rockefeller donated an initial $1 million at that time in 1902, which transforms to like it, it, around now is around $35 million, say $36 million. And they would eventually uh, give over $180 million to, the, uh, to fund the General Education Board. So we're talking like huge amounts of money to fund this um, um, General Education Board, which was, <laughs> there was a secret meeting that took place in 1902 to form it. Does it sound familiar to another secret meeting that took place in 1910 uh, at Jekyll Island? Well, yes, of course it does, because it's the same playbook. But they used this. So if you think about, OK, those that captured the monetary system eight years prior had already captured the education system. So what was more important to them? Well, clearly the education system. So the General Education Board, their philosophy, if you go, uh, you can even go to their Wikipedia and I'm going to read you. A uh, part of a paper, and the paper is called the General Education Board, Occasional Papers Number One, the Country School of Tomorrow. And here's part of, you know, a few of the paragraphs from that, again, referenced in the book that we've been talking about. Here we go. This is the philosophy, the, the white paper, if you will, of the General Education Board. In our dream, we have limitless resources, and the people yield themselves with perfect docility. To our molding hand. I mean, what? That's the first sentence. I mean, do, do you want me to reread it J just in case? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't in even believe our it. Dream, in our dream, we have limitless resources and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. What do you think, like, <laughs> they're not even hiding it. It's on their own website. It's on the Wikipedia page. So this goes on. The present educational conventions fade from their minds and unhampered by tradition. We work our own good will upon a grateful and responsive rural folk. They don't want you thinking for yourself. They don't want you carrying tradition that has been passed down you from your parents, from your parents' parents, from the old countries where you came from, that all needs obliterating. This is exactly what they're saying. It goes on. You'll be glad to know. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or men of science. We have not to raise up from among them authors, editors, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen of whom we have an ample supply. The task we set before ourselves is very simple as well as a very beautiful one to train these people as we find them to a perfectly ideal life just where they are. So we will organize our children into a little community and teach them to do in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way, in the homes, in the shops, and on the farm. What's left to say? I mean, I don't know. I'm speechless at this point. It seems like, you know, that that it's, it's all part of this master plan. And like you said, at first, 
you know, I think the timing is super interesting. So I kind of want to dive into that as to it's it's almost like molding human behavior so that everything could, in a sense, you know, fall based on the monetary policy. Now, at this time, though, the, the dollar was backed by gold. Right. So or at least theoretically, that's that, you know, it wasn't a fiat currency. Now. I guess, was there almost like writing on the wall at this point where it was like the because the education system was so shaky underneath the surface of the entire monetary system that it was only almost a mon matter of time before you create a system that is destined to fail and that you're not going to learn from history where all other fiat currencies previously have continued to fail. So we're just going to kind of get into this never ending cycle. Well, obviously, you know, Bitcoin is kind of the the, the light at the end of the tunnel and and theoretically the the end of of all fiat currencies but is is that in a sense kind of how you see this playing out where it was you know the the bottom layer is just the education the knowledge system the top layer is the monetary policy and if the bottom layer isn't you know strong then essentially the the entire monetary system is going to fail because it's run by humans and you know the education system and everything like that is just you know i guess the the surface and the uh you know, the base of the the knowledge layer is just so poor. Yeah. Well, if, if you own the education system and the monetary system, then you get to teach the monetary system through the education system. Keynesian economics, the exact, you know, thing that most PhD economists have. Or well, now what are they getting taught? Modern monetary theory, like MMT. Come and do a PhD in economics and, you know, so you, you go and do a PhD in economics, you learn MMT, you learn Keynesian economics, um, you learn uh, about supply and demand, all this kind of stuff. But then nobody brings in Austrian economics. Well, if you're, if you're actually studying, and this is at university level, if you're actually studying PhD in economics, surely it's up to you as the student to go out and critically think about what you are being taught and to find alternative ideas to that like that's literally the idea of you being uh, doing uh, a phd whereas many don't you know most people they just want the freaking certificate that's all they're there for and it's it's amusing even to think that you're doing a phd in economics and you've not thought about the opportunity cost of four years locked in a classroom learning the exact same thing as other people hundreds of thousands of other people who are all going to enter the labor market with the same certificate that you have, which is being inflated away. The purchasing power of that certificate is just diminishing beneath your nose. You've made a four year commitment. You're going to come out $250,000 in debt. Like these are pretty bad economic decisions, <laughs> but you're studying to be a PhD economist. So like the whole thing, but only in a clown world, where the education system is owned by those same very people that own the monetary system, can that be the case? And then you can apply that to um, medical as well, like medical school, like because you know what gets taught there? Well, the same people, by the way, that own the monetary system and own the freaking uh, education system also own and fund Big Pharma, which create the education system for, you know, medicine and medical school and, and health. So pushed away is the idea of any kind of homeopathy or naturopathic kind of um, remedies or methods. And pushed away is the study of uh, Eastern medicine. But no, what do we have instead? And pushed away is the study of nutrition. What do we have instead? Well, we just have complete allopathic study on, you know, the... Um, use of uh, oil-based, petrochemical-based, opioid-based drugs, which the same characters involved started pushing through the education system via the American Medical Association, which they pretty much captured in the early 30s. And it's the same, the same people, same group of names. And that can be, you can find that story in Murder by Injection, by Eustace Mullins. So if you want to go pick that book up, that's all in there. Incredible, incredible book. And yeah, <laughs> just read Eustace Mullins Wikipedia first two sentences to realize this is a book you probably need to uh, need to get.
And then, so just to reference the same author, he wrote that, The Secrets of the Federal Reserve, which is another book which ties all of this together. Uh, and con consequently, in the same book here, John Taylor Gatto also mentions the, uh, the Federal Reserve and the formation of the Federal Reserve. So it's all very interlinked. You capture all of these systems, and then you can start crafting society uh, in a much easier way for your own benefit, obviously. Yeah, so it seems like then, then this system, the craft, like what's the end goal then uh, of all of this to craft everything and like kind of manipulate it? Is it so like only a few people really have the true power or, um, you know, what is that kind of like the end uh, where I guess, you know, the people who started all this would say that this is a success and how they wanted it to turn out? Are you looking for the easiest way to get your Bitcoin off an exchange? Well, I've got it for you. It's Foundation Devices. They've got the number one hardware wallet in the Passport. They've even got a concierge service that can help you get your Bitcoin off an exchange with a one-hour private onboarding session. And they've got a great app too, which will give you extremely, extremely, extremely private features on that app so you can use Bitcoin in the most secure way possible. So I've been working hard trying to get sponsors to help you get your Bitcoin off an exchange, and I found it with Foundation, and you can store your seed phrase with a stamp seed punch plate as well. So pair all those together. Use promo code GREENCANDLE at foundation.xyz, and you'll get $10 off your entire order. All right, that's enough for me. Back to the show. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it, it's basically... They keep the power, they keep the assets, they keep the money. And you and I, we get to run on our hamster wheel and, uh, you know, the, the useless eaters as we are, we get to eat the bugs just to barely sustain ourselves. And um, hopefully we don't all, uh, you know, procreate too quickly and, uh, you know, cause a problem to the planet such as the, uh, the thesis of Thomas Malthus, who wrote his thesis back in like the 1770s, uh, which a lot of these complete maniacs, uh, still the guy, you know, Klaus Schwab running the WEF and all of his little minions, uh, believe that, uh, you know, we're overpopulating the planet and uh, we therefore need to be held in check. And God forbid that we should be able to think for ourselves and think critically and build our own businesses and add value, economic value to our communities, all of that needs to be broken down. And um, yeah, m most people think we live under a capitalist regime, whereas you know, I think many people in the Bitcoin space have come to realize, well, this is socialism at the absolute best, if not you know, slightly, uh, slightly warmed up form of communism. Um, and you know, just keep creeping us that way. Uh, don't forget, we were all locked down um, for two years. They, they literally decentralized and outsourced the gulags to our own front rooms. We, we were all imprisoned. And uh, it's, it's crazy to think that, again, none of us own our own property. There is all owned by a bank. If you, if you have a mortgage on a property, that is the bank's property. Uh, it's like you literally, I mean, what's the agenda? 2030. By 2030, you will own nothing and be happy. Well, guess what? You already own nothing and you're fat and angry and that's just going to get worse and you're unhealthy. So that is, yes, that is the, the, the game they like to play. And, uh, you know, if you, the only way you can opt out, you just have to opt out. Uh, and people say, okay, that's great. So what's the answer? Well, don't send your kids to fucking school. First of all, don't do that. If you, if you want to starve the beast, we've got to stop feeding the beast, our kids, hearts, minds, and souls. Like that makes absolutely no sense. What would you do that for? And it sounds shocking for people to hear me say that, but, you know, maybe they can go and study a little bit older, but, you know, be, when they become 16, 20, and they've had 16 years with you at home and they think they can think critically and they want to spread their wings a little bit and they want to go and learn, you know, study formally somewhere, go for it because they will fly in that system they will be able to think critically they'll be able to call bullshit and they'll most likely walk away and they won't think of themselves as dropping out they'll think of themselves as opting out because they've been around you and your family for all of that like those formative years 
They can already think for themselves. Whereas if we just blindly send them off on the school bus at the age of, well, it's not even, right? Most, most families now are passing their kid over to daycare or to somebody else before they're even one. I mean, this is the most traumatic thing that could ever happen to a human being. Um, you know, like the human experience is completely shattered at birth in many ways. Uh, then, you know, my goodness, then we can get into modern day birthing practices. Another uh, knockdown of the um, American education system and the uh, the idea that, uh, you know, all birth should take place in a sterile room. I've done a podcast on that with Katie the Russian. You'll have to go back and find that one and you can link to it because she absolutely obliterates that idea. Uh, but here we are. We're still learning. Um, but yeah, giving your kids up instead of them being at home. Um, and it, it does take a dramatic life change to do that. But what's at stake? What is at stake? Like your, your, your child's well-being, mental health, um, and their, you know, their future. So taking more responsibility for that, not just sending them into the education system. That's one way to opt out. The other way to opt out is don't use their money, man. Don't use it. Get away from it. Exchange it for something better. And what's better? Well, Bitcoin is better. And there's a, there's a, you know, a ton of reasons why. But the main reason being you can now save in, you can save your time and energy in something that is not being deliberately it's literally been designed, again, if you read the secrets of the Federal Reserve, it's been designed in such a way to perpetually debase the currency in which you spend time and energy working for. It makes a mockery of you, of human life, and I, I don't want to be a part of it anymore. I know you don't want to be a part of it anymore, Brandon, and the more people we can help see that, uh, the better because it is actually very easy to do all you have to do is start moving start slowly start moving across some of your dollars your euros your pounds your currency your fiat currency of choice your shit coin of choice into bitcoin and do it slowly deliberately learn as you go those people listening to this podcast now are already putting in the hours and hats off to you just keep your foot on the gas and keep learning uh, because yeah, there's nothing more important than opting out of those two specific areas. And then the third specific area I would say opting out of is uh, the, the current medical hell in which you you might be held hostage to because uh, you know, the opioid crisis and the, uh, the allopathic drugs and whatever else that we've been prescribed by Oh, man, like these people that went to medical school to make a difference in life. It's like teachers. They go to, uh, you know, they're, they're born to be mentors. They're born to be healers, these people. And they've just been absolutely captured. And uh, I feel I feel bad for for like, you know, their, their, their skill sets are being used against the people in which they were, you know, born to help. Uh, so we need to we just need to break the cycle of all of this stuff. And we're not going to break the cycle if you're dependent on their money. As soon as you are not dependent on their money, everything else downstream of that falls into place. And uh, The Hidden Cost of Money by Seb Bunny, uh, that is a real great book. This is uh, what it looks like for those wondering. He describes all of this, chapters upon chapters upon chapters about how um financial forces shape our lives and the world around us yeah i mean there, there's a, a lot to unpack there but i think that i got another book for you that i think you'd like it's called the epidemic of absence which essentially is like we've gotten so clean and so sterile that that's why we have a lot of you know uh autoimmune diseases I, the reason i started mm -hmm. reading that full disclosure is because uh, you know my little sister has rheumatoid arthritis and she's you know, younger than me she got that uh diagnosed with that late high school, early college. And, you know, obviously somebody that, that age, and, you know, she was a great athlete, ended up running track in college as well. Um, you know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but she was probably a better athlete than I was <laughs> at a certain point in time. But, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, all, with all that being said, it's, it is kind of interesting where it's like, you know, that thought experiment is, are we almost too clean where, you know, um, you know, we're not, 
prepping our own bodies to to live in this this environment but you know i think that's a huge rabbit hole that we could probably spend hours and hours diving down but you know in a sense how do you think that the the way that the money system would i guess fix that like do you think that there's there i basically see like two different paths that we can go down in order to get to like a full bitcoin hard money standard the first one is basically the entire system as we know it right now just totally collapses it might take decades to rebuild but it just crashes quick some people might get uh you know kind of screwed in that sense or we have kind of like a slow gradual um you know shift into there where more people are starting to opt out of the system kind of like we're seeing right now where we see more people opt into a bitcoin standard and we kind of get into there obviously it's going to be met with some resistance along the way but in a sense that's where we're kind of going um so do you think that that is you know wh which direction do you see us kind of going in uh in order to kind of get to this full bitcoin standard are you looking for the number one place to find all the information you can about Bitcoin, whether it's price, whether it's hash rate, whether it's the latest up to date things outside of Bitcoin, whether it's nation state adoption, what have you? Well, I've got the place for you. Check out BitcoinNews.com. They've even got the number one newsletter in the game when it comes to Bitcoin because it gives you all the up to date information on every single thing that happened in the past week. That'll come to your inbox every single Monday morning. You could sign up using this code right down here or this link. It's also in the show notes. So come join me and thousands and thousands of other people that are getting the most up-to-date information from BitcoinNews.com and their newsletter. All right, let's get back to the show. We need more education. That's the key. Uh, how are you and I here right now? I'm here because... I listen to thousands of hours of podcasts. I'm here because I've read, I can't even count the books down there. I keep grabbing. Uh, I'm here because I've watched uh, God knows how many hours of YouTube videos. And this is all education. And the only way that we're really going to get like the word out to the masses and get them comfortable with the idea that Bitcoin is this, not this, Ponzi scheme and not this network that only criminals are using and not this planet damaging ocean boiling nonsense that we uh, we get fed via Greenpeace. The only way we're going to manage that is by more people who have already done the work stepping into the fray and putting their head above the parapet and saying, you know what, I've got something to say about this too. And uh, that 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 takes a lot of bravery. Uh, kudos to you for what you're doing and uh, trying to build something. You're trying to build on Bitcoin. This is something people don't understand. When when you you hear that saying, "I need to build on Bitcoin," people turn off because I'm not a software developer. I can't build on Bitcoin. It's like, no man, you can. Like, what are you? Are you an artist? Are you a musician? Do you have a voice? Are you a writer? Everybody can do. Can you make? Can you design? playing cards can you design card games can you design whatever it is you've got something in you and within you that can add something to somebody else's education of what bitcoin is i'm not saying you're going to like create the next hardware wallet and i'm not saying you're going to like just spin up a, a self-custodial lightning wallet in your spare time either like yeah that's building on bitcoin but no like you know writing a kid's book there's not nearly enough of those there are some, but not nearly enough. And uh, starting a YouTube channel, uh, you know, aimed at sp specific niches. Uh, you know, you're, you're aiming this at a specific niche. We need somebody to aim at a completely different one. And we may we may never see that. It doesn't matter. Some people will, and you'll never un you'll never know who you're inspiring, and you'll never know the ripple effect of what they might go on to do themselves. And uh, that's what we need. And it, it's it sounds basic, but look at the power they ruled over us because they ruled the education system, the they. We can do the same. We've just got to curate our own education. We've got to write our own books. We've got to create our own courses and just get that out to as many people as we can for free and open source. 
And uh, yeah, Shield to Open Sats that have just started their education grant. Uh, in fact, uh, that I was very excited to see that news. Dread dropped that news um, at Dream of Polvo, I think, on uh, on Twitter. Um, that they were going to start doing that, and they're going to start writing grants for educators, uh, specifically online and specifically uh, open source projects. So we can get as many people comfortable with creating content as possible because some people out there they might be thinking yeah that's all great dan but i've got a fiat job i can't step off the hamster wheel i've got to get food on the table i've got to keep a roof over my head well now if you've got an idea and you can apply for this grant and they're going to give you a year or two runway with monthly payments then you can start seriously considering getting off the hamster wheel so it's certainly worth going to check out so if you go to open sats if you follow open sats they've got all the information there on their website and just find that link and, and get um get down the rabbit hole and, and find out what you can do to start uh adding value there and one one thing i just posted a, a link in your chat uh about niacin and arthritis which uh, i'd love for you to share with with your sister because uh going back to health i've done a few podcasts on on niacin which is just vitamin B3 and um, like the, the stuff that it's cured, which since doing these podcasts, I've started a whole different group on, on signal and people are just posting the most incredible um, results. And it, arthritis is one of these things that, that can be managed, not with allopathic drugs, but with just supplementing, uh, you know, good doses of vitamin B3. Yeah. And I, you know, you know, I did notice that and I already sent it to her and it's interesting because she's in the the healthcare system too. And I've, I've met a couple of girls here in town uh, in the healthcare system as well. And, you know, one of them recently just voiced me like, yeah, you know, I, I work at a family practice. I see the same exact clients coming in every week, every couple of months and nothing changes. And they all just want a drug that, you know, like Ozempic is a huge drug now that, that that's being tossed around because oh, people God. don't want to exercise and, you know, eat right. They just want to lose the weight. Um, and so it's just like a never ending problem where all these people, you know, she, uh, the, one of the girls I was talking to even was telling people like, you got to exercise. Like, and I feel like that's kind of an uncommon thing to tell people these days because that's just not what a patient really wants to hear they want to hear the easy way out and you know i guess like the the whole taking self ownership of your own, you're only you only got your own body right until for as long as you're living on this planet so why don't you you treat it right and you know kind of uh you know fuel it correctly like all these kind of things it's just like such a foreign topic and we've gotten so far away from that now do you think that's almost uh, in a sense, like kind of like the participation trophy thing where it's like, all right, like, you know, we've never really needed to strive and achieve anything, right? First, it's, you know, uh, the lack of thinking, uh, thinking critically, just straight up trusting the entire medical system. And the second is almost killing motivation where it's like, you know, all these things, right? Whether it's in that now, it's almost like owning a home, owning your own business. These things have become so almost seemingly unattainable because the uh, underlying currency is inflated away where it's making everything so much more difficult to do, where it's easier just to, for a lot of people, just to give up, wipe their hands of it, and just say, okay, this is how life is. You know, I'm going to sit here, go drive miserab miserably to my nine to five, sit here for 40 to 50 hours a week, and then, uh, you know, kind of just want to go home and turn my brain off. Like, do you think that that's part of the issue as well? It's like almost killing the motivation underneath, um, you know, the, the, or the, the underlying currency is killing motivation. Are you looking for the best way to orange pill your friends and family? Well, I've got a way for you. That's got a little bit of a nostalgia factor. I've got Bitcoin trading cards. They've got the Genesis pack. I've got an open pack right here, sitting here where you can hand out a bunch of these cards with some great, great artwork. We've got tyranny, we've got fear, uncertainty, and doubt right here, the FUD card. So we've got a lot of great things to teach you a bunch of lessons about Bitcoin and the current space. And they've even got some cool things of cool people even doing some stuff in the Bitcoin space. I've got the Bitcoin racing card here, even signed by my boy, Chris Primetime McKenzie. So you can get all of that at btc-tc.com. Use promo code GREENCANDLE. You can get 10% off your entire order. 
to orange pill your friends and family and collect some cool artwork of people that are doing some awesome stuff in the Bitcoin space and help spread that orange pill around the globe. All right, enough from me. Back to the show. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. You nailed it. Uh, you know, entrepreneurism, <clears throat> the entrepreneurial spirit is innate in human beings. It is just our default form. <clears throat> but through the education system, we've had that completely beaten out of us. We are problem solving machines, right? As Jeff Booth would say, that is that's basically the definition of an entrepreneur. Every single one of us has probably had goodness knows how many thousands of business ideas when you're just sitting there bored um, or you see an, an opportunity in the market. Oh, why isn't that? Oh, right. Yeah, well, that should be reiterated on and then that would be better. This is what used to happen. Like, you know, now, no. Entrepreneurs are this special breed of people that they're the ones, like the Steve Jobs of this world, the, the Richard Bransons, the Elon Musks. They've got way more brain power than you could ever have. It's like, no, no, not at all. That isn't that they just they just went and did it. And we all can just go and do it. But we have that fear baked in that you're gonna fail. Society's gonna judge you for that failure. Like you said, everyone gets an award, right? Well, no, you shouldn't if you didn't win. Um, because it that creates the society in which we have today and starting a business as well is so difficult because the odds are stacked against you because who are you competing with well not just other people in your in your sector but you're competing with the government because the government can tax you out of business whenever they want raise lower taxes they can regulate you out of business whenever they want and you're competing in the labor market with them because they set minimum wage laws they set minimum minimum age requirement laws and they also uh send out social welfare so you are literally as an employer battling this force with an infinite amount of cash who can change regulations on you at any point during the day and are competing with them in the labor market because they're sending out free money to people Who would even begin to want to start a business? And who does that benefit? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know at that point, right? I mean, like at that at that point, like, you know, starting a business and benefiting, it just is causing the banking system to almost continue, right? Because you need more capital. You need to get in more and more debt. You need to get in more debt in order to work in the system. So it's just kind of elevating the current system. And it seems like there's, you know, in a sense, no way out at this point, right? Because there's, you know, what are, what are your options at this point? You can either work a good job and what do you need to get a good job? You need to go to the traditional education system, which, you know, in the US is not, not free. You need to go get a degree, maybe even a master's or a PhD. Uh, so you're getting into hundred, uh, hundreds of thousands of debt. Then wh where are you going to live? You need to buy a house. How can you afford a house? Uh, in order to afford a house, you need to get into more hundreds of thousands of debt. And then, you know, and even to fulfill the, the quote unquote American dream, you're almost in a million dollars worth of debt at this point where it's like you're getting your your education, you're getting your home and then, you know, you're starting a business. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like the never ending cycle. And then how are you going to get out? What What is that life raft? And I think at this point, the only life raft I can really see out there is Bitcoin. Because it's you know the best performing asset against all fiat currencies since its creation, and you know if you're able to save, what what better savings technology? All you have to do is try to wait out the the traditional system. Because as we see it, you know you and I have seen it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast are starting to see it. Where you know if you save in Bitcoin, um, the traditional underlying system is going to default itself. So in a sense, that's that's uh, you all. That's all you got to wait on is that you the powers that be kind of deflate their own currency that they're in control of. So, um, you know, in a sense, that's that's kind of I think where where we're going, right? Yeah. And if you, I mean, if you want to get down another rabbit hole, right on this subject, um, there's a book, and you can see it's very very short book. 
it's just a chapter from a larger book red symphony is that is that showing you as back to front i'm holding these up um no, it you see the, yeah it does I oh, okay so red symphony by jay landowski and this is a conversation that took place between the um two russians uh one russian was the uh, the ambassador to france who was a trotskyite and the other one was stalin's top nkvd agent and um the russian but rakovsky the, the russian ambassador to france was to be hanged the next day until he disclosed what he disclosed in this book about how the monetary system was put in place that saved his life he was not hanged the next day he ended up dying in a gulag of course a decade or two later but such was the gravity of the information that he was able to you know give stalin and the NKVD about how the monetary system had been put in place. That's what saved him from going for the gallows. And uh, yeah, it, it, not many Bitcoiners have read this book. Uh, so I would say 100% read it because it's a conversation. It's a transcript of a conversation. This isn't an opinion piece. This is a conversation that happened, which uh, was, uh, and that transcript was rescued off the dead body of the third person in the room. Who was the translator and uh he kept uh a third copy uh one went to the nkvd agent one went to stalin and he kept one secretly which was found upon his person by a spanish shot soldier when uh, his body was found in uh, of course in a gulag um so check that one out because everything that you were just saying there uh this this book is going to tie together a lot of loose ends for you Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to check that out. And I got to link all these in the show notes as well. So anybody that's curious uh, can can follow along and, and read a lot of these books that we're, we're mentioning here. But Daniel, you've been very generous with your time. So I really appreciate you coming on the State of Bitcoin podcast. Why don't you tell people where they could find you? And uh, yeah, what else you got going on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my podcast, as you can see written there, it's called uh, The Once Bitten Podcast. And uh, like you, I just interview people from around the world and try and get into interesting stories, try and learn about their background, try and learn about what brought them to Bitcoin, why, how it's changed their life, what they think um, it's going to mean for their, you know, their, their futures, their families going forward. Uh, so lots of great conversations and um, everything is, yeah, I'm not almost 480 episodes there. So there's a lot of time for, for people to put in, but you can dip around. I also cover topics like the education system. I've had people on that aren't into Bitcoin, but have written books about the education system. Uh, and I've also had people on uh, talking about health and, and whatever else as well. So that's all. Um, and that's been a huge part of my own learning journey as well. You know, being, be, being, I get to listen to these conversations firsthand and ask the questions that are pertinent to my mind. And this is why I push as many people as possible just to start reaching out, and record a conversation, release it as a podcast. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, the other thing that people might want to find is my book is uh, called Choose Life. There it is. And I wrote this. I wrote this before I um, found Bitcoin. Uh, this was about leaving the rat race uh, with my wife and my four kids. That's how we started falling down the alternative education rabbit hole uh homeschool unschool world school whatever you want to call it we uh you know we practice them all and uh yeah go find it uh, i think it mentions the word bitcoin once in there uh, so it's um that's that's another resource for people if they're if they're looking to leave their, their fiat job and um want to see how another family did it you know it's not a two book it's like how we did and uh, I hope it inspires many more families. A hundred percent. And I'll link all those in the show notes. So I think everybody's got a lot of reading material after this episode yeah. too. So Daniel, thanks so much, man. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to the latest episode of the State of Bitcoin podcast. If you really enjoyed this one, I've got another one cooking up for you. You can click that right here and you can go to the next episode, which is an absolute banger where you know I'm bringing you only the latest and greatest guests. Or if you're looking for more macro-related content, you could check out my other channel, Macro Insights Pod. I got it linked for you right here. 
So where I'm bringing you more about stocks, real estate, traditional finance stuff. So go ahead and check that out. And if you enjoyed this podcast, go ahead and hit that like, hit that subscribe button and tell a friend to tell a friend. All right, enough from me. I'll see you at the next one.